You drive so many thoughts. Um, <laughs> let's let's break it down. So, I think yes, self love has become completely extreme. But I think I think ultimately there's nothing wrong with accepting oneself, but also understanding that you have come from the Father, the Holy Spirit, right? And so it's incredibly important that we understand that who we are as people isn't just who we are. We're not encapsulated in our own self absorbed, you know, bubble. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, I can, I don't hate the way that I look in the mirror, but I'm also not going to sit there and just like glorify the way that I look. I think that's a little odd. Um, I think this is where mainstream feminism or modern feminism has really skyrocketed over the years. And it's convinced that, you know, for a long time, a a woman's beauty was, was just everything, right? If Mm -hmm. you're skinny, like in that photo, that 1999 Calvin Klein model, she's super skinny toned, you know, that was the epitome of what women should look like, what beauty looked like. And so therefore, if you were anything but something like that, you weren't considered beautiful. That is 100% the most demonic way to look at it. And then nowadays, now you have models who are a little bit more plus size, which I don't necessarily think is wrong. It's a healthy shift saying that like you don't need to starve yourself or what have you, but it's now sexualized both bodies. Either way, you're sexualizing someone who's super skinny and you're sexualizing someone who is a little bit curvier. And it's like, why can't we accept both, right? Instead, you're taking one extreme from one era and an extreme from another era. And so there's no consistency. It's just a trend. So right now, being curvy and vivacious and whatever is in, who knows what 10 years down the road looks like. So there's there's all of these marketing um, efforts to monetize off insecure women. Mm-hmm. Off, you know what I mean? So it's, Yeah. I don't point. see. I don't know if it's a like, are you saying like it's a just the trend now and the pendulum might swing back to, you know, standards think, that were that we, you know, previously held? I think it, I think it's just unfortunate the way that um, body types are seen as like what's in versus what's not instead of just accepting the body type for what it is. Like mm-hmm. if people understand the way bodies actually worked, there are lots of genetics that go into this. So the 19. 19- yeah. Um, Calvin Klein model who was super skinny also probably had great genetics to work with as a foundation so it wasn't hard for her to look the way that she did mm. now you've got you know other other issues you got you got women who've had multiple issues and so it creates just genetically bigger babies genetically bigger humans right I don't know like the size to all of that necessarily but you know People are bigger because they're just bigger. <laughs> like we're not the same size we were like a hundred years ago. That's for damn sure. You've got Cheetos as a main food group nowadays. It's made it to the to the food pyramid. So that's that's another topic entirely. But I guess it's just the way that I see it. It the whole modeling around what's acceptable to women's bodies and the way that we dress each body type. It's so unfortunate because you're sending mixed signals, especially to younger women who are struggling with the way that they look and have a hard time accepting the way that they look when yeah. most of the time it is your genetics it is your environment that is that's primarily the reason like coming as a former big girl myself you know my parents didn't purchase all organic grass-fed meat mm-hmm. either. you know what i mean like so you can't you can't blame you can't blame people but what I'm seeing is it to me, it seems to be following like the trend in art, like modern art. Hmm. So to me, modern art and, you know, I'm no art historian by any means, but it was kind of a revolution against classical art. And interesting. And in making this that. revolution, they went to, you know, they went to an extreme and r- really reduced art. You know, art started becoming like, you know, Jackson Pollock and and Rothko just like slabbing on colors on canvases and and randomness. And this is art and taping like a banana to a wall and saying this is art. Um, And objectivity kind of went by the wayside. Um, And so I think 
I totally agree with yeah. Let's let's help people love themselves, accept themselves, and not like have all these insecurities. But if the price or the cost of that is, um, we're also teaching people that uh, health is health itself is objective because health health and beauty and how you look they're kind of intertwined. You can't really separate them right and and that's what i think is try, uh, people are trying to do marketing i don't know who's you know pulling the strings on all of this but if you can get people to disassociate health and beauty um then you know what they'll eat the cheetos and they'll buy the calvin Klein's, right so i always wonder it's though. a little deeper than them because I, I don't believe calvin klein you know is trying to you know, help people feel good. They're just trying to make money. Um, I, I don't think they at, care about what anyone feels good either. I, I, I think, right. I think what's really fascinating to me is like the question on who they're actually gearing these ads to. Are they to men because men feed into sex and images more than women, mm -hmm. or is it to insecure women that are wanting to look like the model? Yeah. I think you could make the argument that it could be both. Yeah. Because men are intrigued by the brand and could influence their their partner on you know buying certain items right or mm -hmm. it's women who are desperately looking for a way to feel beautiful and they see an ad like that and believe oh wow the ad just changed my life because look a woman who looks similar to me can look beautiful and that's like why did you need an ad to tell you that? Right, right, <laughs> like, right. Why are you basing your entire existence and your confidence on a stupid multi-million dollar ad for executives that don't know you, don't care where you've come from, and frankly, just want what's in your wallet? Well, how do you get that self-confidence if deep within yourself, I think everyone knows, like, people have those standards within themselves or else they wouldn't feel self-conscious or whatever. Well, how do you develop those? How do you develop that confidence internally? You know, if you aren't, you know, if you don't look like the the supermodel or whatever. No, I hear you. You know, I my my whole um, childhood, I was a big girl. I was not a healthy big girl. I was a bigger girl, and I got bullied everywhere. Just this is for context, because I'm going to answer your question, but. Mm -hmm. um, for context, like I was bullied at home. I was bullied at school. I was bullied from church people. Like it was constant nagging in my ear. So I never really liked the way that I looked up until, um, and mind you, mind you, I played sports. So I was a big girl that was active. And that was even bizarre for people to understand. Like, how could a bigger person run and jump and do all those things? Like, whoa. It was yeah. hilarious because like back then I was like, I'm not struggling. <laughs> like I'm it, yeah, it, it's it's harder, but I could I could swing it. But anyway, um, so the way that I built self-confidence was one this had to be organic from myself. I wasn't going to get it from a family member, a friend, a priest, anybody like no ad could help me do that. And when I had decided that I wanted to lose weight for myself and not for external factors, there was this process I would tell myself and I would just force a compliment of myself. Like I would just like look in the mirror and be like, I look good. I look good. I look good. Mm -hmm. I just had to, I know that's probably the worst advice to give any woman, but I just honestly had to fake it till I made it. But there was a point in time where faking it till I made it actually turned into cockiness and it was unhealthy confidence because I started getting attention that I'd never had before from my weight loss. And so that just fed into my brain. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm not so bad looking. Like yeah. I'm going to work it. And it, it hurt me in the end because I didn't realize that it was, that people were were speaking of me so negatively in that sense. So it's like they were speaking poorly about me if I was bigger. And then they were speaking poorly about me when I had lost weight. And I was just like, haters are gonna hate. Like I had that whole attitude. <laughs> like it was it was a whole thing. But now I've as I've grown into my twenties and going now going into my thirties, I, I understand that like 
my confidence has nothing to do with who I am and everything to do with how I love God and how he sees me. And I think once I understood that piece, Mm -hmm. I don't care what people think of me at all, whether what I say, how I do my hair, if I gain a couple pounds or not, you know, now I, I'm so free that I know that ultimately when I die, God's not going to look at me and be like, did you love yourself enough? (laughs) Like (laughs) you, did you do your best to stay healthy? You know what I mean? Like there's, there's so many other factors that make beauty. I don't think the way that my pants fit have anything to do with it. Yeah. What was the hardest part going through that kind of transition um, from big girl to not big girl? Um, you know, I'll be quite honest with you. I think the hardest part was realizing the people that were always bullying me about how big I was suddenly wanted to be my friend, mm. suddenly liked me a little bit more. We're like, oh, yeah, she's not half bad looking. I would want to associate myself with her. Oh, she's mm-hmm. getting a lot more attention. I want to be popular or in her circle. Yeah. And that was devastating because that's when I started to pull away from those people. Mm-hmm. And then they thought I was being like selective, like, oh, no, you can't be in my circle because I don't like you. It's like, no, I don't like you because you're fake as hell. <laughs> like, there's a difference. Yeah. And that's something about my personality that has never changed. Like I can sniff it immediately. Mm-hmm. And so now I know you have a really healthy relationship with food and you're kind of a big wellness advocate and stuff like that. Do you look around in our community and by our community, I mean like the Egyptian community, Coptic community, whatever, and see like there's just a lot of problems there? Yeah, I mean – even till this day, like I'll have like, like family members will just be like, Oh, you're not eating as much today. Like here, here, eat, eat as if like I'm starving myself or, and there was a point in time where I was doing that, but you know, because I I'm going through healing and things like that, I don't feel the need to do that. So there's the constant looking at my food, making sure I have portions, people asking me if I'm going for seconds, um, or like if you eat too much, they're like, oh, you're bloated. You look you look a little bloated <laughs> after that, you know? It's like you can't yeah. win, Is that candor like a, something you you embrace and like about our community or is it annoying like that? Um, like I'm sure when as you were losing weight, people were like, wow, you're losing so much weight. You look great. And then when you weren't losing weight, like. Habibti, you know. Oh man, <laughs> we should go with you, kid. Or I don't know what I heard told that you. one. I heard but... you'll never get married. I had someone one time. I went out with church people, and we were at Red Robin, and um, someone I ordered a burger like everybody else. And Red Robin's a gourmet burger place, by the way. It's a chain restaurant. In case yeah. no one knows what that is. And I ordered a burger, and someone's just like, "Shouldn't you be ordering a salad?" Oof. Yeah, and I, I laughed, and because my my thing that my grandparents had taught me is never let anyone see uh, your weakness, which is probably in twenty twenty three not the best advice. <laughs> yeah, now it's like be super vulnerable. Yeah, it's like be everywhere. vulnerable, like don't be <laughs> too high in public. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. you should have no. confronted them on the spot. Yeah, like I, I wasn't gonna confront. Them. I just would laugh it off or be like, haha, aren't you? Like I would just be sassy back, and so. Yeah. So it it used to hurt me um, a lot more when I was younger, but now I'm kind of like, I sometimes I sympathize with them because I think they're coming from a place where maybe either their insecurity or they've seen how I've overcome a lot and they just want to make sure that like, you know, I'm, I'm well. So I just, a lot of times the things that I hear is just one ear out the other. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to be upset. I'll just move on. So this camera view is, like, cutting out, like, f- kind of from chest level and below. But, you know, I'm kind of a, a chunky monkey myself. And I was a chunkier monkey going up. Um, and it was on, it was really only, like, I, ac- I feel like I accidentally found out about, like, how to eat healthy, like, just on YouTube. Like, you know, you oh, kind wow. of stumble across, like, some guy talking about, keto and that leads you to some like one of these dr berg type guys who like 
talks about gut health or whatever and it's like you get you go on this rabbit hole and like you like because we're not taught no one teaches us like our community i think is not that or was not or what i don't want to generalize but uh just health conscious like understand nutrition and things like that and well, you know you, you don't study, it's all carbs and starches there's absolutely exactly no balance in that. although like although like the mediterranean diet is like actually a really healthy diet i think our problem is we just eat way too many like too much you know it's too like, much feast yeah and too it... many times per day it's like a human doesn't if unless you're running marathons and stuff you don't need to eat this much food man yeah man i i hear you. i i agree with you because i think i think mediterranean is healthy but the way that Egyptians eat, it's like, because we, like Christians at least, fast, I think it's 265 days out of the year. Yeah. So like eat 1% healthy. of Christians. Yeah. Like, yeah. The fast that, that about Yeah. So the sure. fast is like vegetables and legumes and like all these fortified whole foods. And then literally the hour that they can get meat, they just pound it in their face. And it's like a meat overload. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, how is that? Healthy? Forget the hour after. What about the hours and weeks and days before? People like build up to this, like this fast is coming. Let's like oh my go god. to wherever. Oh my god, it's like it's ridiculous. Yeah, we do a tradition uh, here in Vancouver. Well, where um before a big fast, like it, like for Lent especially, but we did it for the Christmas one too. Um, for Lent, the the weekend before or like the Friday before we'll go with everyone. We'll just go get like wings and it's like 50 cent wings at this one nasty place, but the wings are spot on. And you see, you see guys pounding like, <laughs> like three pounds of wings, like <laughs> in their life. And it's disgusting. I mean, yeah. I'm in normal portion. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hilarious. So anyway, so, it's definitely become more of a cultural custom yeah, yeah. thing to just be together and like binge on things you won't have for 50 days. But eating itself, and this is something that's not talked about a lot, is a spiritual activity. Like yes. the word, I think the word for altar and Coptic or Greek is tarapesa, which mm. means table. And so our, our meals are dinners with family and all of that's an extension of that in a way and i heard someone talk about this and that it should be done in like an actual spiritually spiritual manner as well right like in prayer without like we shouldn't be like the way we eat now even the way we consume food forget about what we consume it's like on the go in the car at your desk while you're working there's no like there's no um sacramental like component to it like eating feeding your body is like it should be like a spiritual thing but that's completely divorced the way we just take it as like fuel or whatever just to keep me going and i think our role models you know these obese priests you know why are they why are they all obese what is this like they, what how is this possible fed. they also probably get fed at izumas if you think about it they're like how many homes are they going to on a weekly basis? You know, and they, they like people are just coming out with the best of the best platter, you know, like uh -huh. the moms are bringing out everything. Like it's like I even when priests come over, I don't know what it was like in, in your household, but it was yeah. like my mom got so excited to offer cookies, cake, maybe a little bit of fruit, but no. Oh, and he had to stay for dinner. Like you can't leave. How disrespectful, you yeah. know? So it's like I. I get it, but they're, they're not doing four or five of those a week. Oh, I mean, maybe they are. I don't know. I mean, they're they're going to one quite a bit. Like, I don't I don't understand what a priest does um, entirely, but I I can almost assume that when they're visiting people, it's it's a ritual. It like has to happen. Okay, but, so you're giving them a pass, Marina. I might as long as, long as they're like... serving God and going to people's houses. They should be the most prime example of how not to eat. I totally get it. But imagine being a priest that like tells people no. Like I feel like that won't be received well unless you have some sort of medical condition. Like AP has his um like he he has a autoimmune condition and he literally can't eat 99.9% .9 of the food that exists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So and people don't really take the time to understand that. So 
Like I get, I, I get that. But for the most part, it's like, imagine if you're busy though. And the only thing you can do is go through a McDonald's drive through on your way to the next Azuma. I don't know. Yeah. That might be hard. I don't know. I don't okay. know. The that. All right. I'm not going to, I won't, I won't uh, crucify them here on this <laughs> podcast, but I think if we, if we look at records, photographic evidence i don't think it was the black cassock that changed things a lot of them were kind of uh on that maybe it's a prerequisite i don't know like you you're capable of eating at four azumas per week or something Ooh, that's uh, 